next speaker is uh, Dr. Ramji Rapake and he will be speaking on role of faith in science and spirituality. Uh, Dr. Rapake, please. Yeah, good afternoon everyone. So uh, today I am going to uh, speak about the indispensability of uh, faith in the so called science and spirituality which we have been uh, looking to and then hearing to the presentations by expert lectures by expert speakers uh, from uh, at least from the last one and a half days. So we will see what is the role of the particular so called faith in having deeper understanding or what is a feeling of what the science and what the spirituality is. So I will try to make this presentation to be so short and crisp so that you, you do not lose the interest. So in the first step, uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. who is a Nobel laureate in peace, so he is saying about the faith is taking the first step even when you do not see the whole staircase. So that is what he is feeling and what do you mean by faith? So what do you mean by faith? So if you see faith is complete or uh, subjective confidence or trust in a person or uh, thing or deity or in the doctrines or teachings of a particular religion or any view like in say if you say in quote and unquote the views rather than you can say if you do not want if you are so averse to the word using religion. So when you see this based on this, this this is the first step in your either the scientific journey or in your spiritual journey. And faith in science will be based on ideas which are basically inspirations. And when you on the on contrary when you say this the faith in spirituality will be on mentor or who is what you say most specifically God or Almighty. And so just I am going to have a glance of few examples where you can really see the importance or prominence of faith in this especially in the uh, what do you say uh, scientific endeavors. So science involves gradual fitness as you have seen and many of you might have experienced while doing the practicals or experimentations in their own laboratories and if so it starts with inspiration as I said it may be coming out of some divine source and then it in, uh, makes you to give an answer like I say in my class. Okay, you may not be having a priori knowledge, but you can question or you can answer to my question based on your simple intuition that you are not going to use your mind so extensively right. And from this you can try to make some postulates and then hypothesis and then you make a final theory and based on this theory you go for experiments and then definitely it may not be completely fine fit and then you go for refining the so called theory based on which you have done the experiments. And once you are happy and you see that there are no contradictions and there are no further issues then you can say this is the experimental proof what you say and then which can lead to have a final law. So this is the law basically uh, it may be having some omissions and additions like but this is the general process of the so called the scientific evaluation or scientific fitness which is taking place. So these are the basic elements of the so called scientific methods and this is how you see the faith based on the faith whatever the thing we have based on the inspiration or intuition you are proceeding towards an distilled essence in the so called scientific endeavor. And if you have a glance of the things I am not going deep into this because each single topic is itself an deep ocean like and let us try to understand what you mean by the nature of the science here. So if you see uh, there are certain verifiable uh, objects are verifiable observations and then there are few things which cannot be verifiable. And for example the verifiable would be like the photoelectric effect and which we see which we could see the uh, what is it the electrons which are getting ejected when the light source is falling on the metal plate like and you can see uh, only through some specific uh, instruments especially this what is the uh, what is a though it is the micro level but it can be uh, macro level but it is a micro level phenomena can be seen by the so called powerful microscopes like and this can be verified with your uh, other knowledge 
But when it comes to the non-verifiable ones like intuitions, which you may not be able to verify and you may not be possessed with the necessary tools required for verifying these so called uh, what is say intuitions. And further in the science though if you see this uh, maybe uh, beyond 20 centuries old like and then even much, much further beyond that the Kepler's faith he has put lot of faith in this Euclidean geometry where you say based on the certain axioms and then uh, statements you make this type of particular rules where what is the two lines are passing through only one point of intersection and all and this is what you say the uh, Cartesian coordinate system like almost. But when you go for further this so called Euclidean geometry may not be sufficient enough to define a particular natural events like. For example like uh, the so called uh, Riemannian geometry uh, which is a branch of differential geometry and then which is the basis for the Einstein's general theory of relate, uh, rela uh, relativity GTR and what it says if you want to have a uh, linking between the space and then time like if you want to have a temporal variation as well as spatial variations you need to link those things that can be done only with the Riemannian geometry which is a curved geometric uh, what is proposition like unlike that of the Euclidean one. So then you can see you are basically your interest or your faith keeps on developing on these events when you are going in particular endeavors like. And further example would be like the kinetic theory of gases. So all of we have studied in our basic uh, what is elementary uh, classes. So what it says if you see in the micro level of course, but in the macro level or in the continuum level you may not be knowing exactly what is going on. So everything is based on the so called uh, hypothesis theory and then you are making it as a law that is what the kinetic theory of gases. So what it says the particles are in constant motion and no attractions or repulsions between these particles as well and a lot of space between the particles compared to the size of the particles themselves and further the last one is the particle speed increases with the increase in the speed and this thing you can see when in a grass level by suppose if you have a tank of gas and then you increase the temperature eventually there will be change in the pressure also and then you will see that okay this is more in randomness or in more in chaotic situation. And then if you decrease the temperature and then the same opposite is true as well and then there is a less randomness. So what it says if you want to collate or if you want to correlate the so called uh, what is a macroscopic events to that of the microscopic events. So you require the so called the macroscopic entities like pressure, temperature and volume which you can measure directly and then related to these microscopic quantities are the molecular level velocities which you may not be able to exactly uh, quantify those things. So if you have these microscopic quantities so directly you can correlate the so called micro level activities with the so called the macro level uh, quantities. And so this has only an inferential proof. So that is what uh, Dr. Khan was saying about the three methods of uh, acquiring the knowledge like. So this is only an inferential proof. You can't exactly see neither or you can't exactly prove unless you, you have that feeling like. So next one is like the most famous one like uh, entropy. Third law of thermodynamics says that a particular so called uh, body is at 0 Kelvin especially the crystalline materials because there won't be any gaps for the pure crystalline substance. And then there the, at 0 Kelvin the entropy is 0. Basically to let me say in the layman language like the entropy means I am shouting. So I am creating certain amount of disorder in this system. So if I do not shout or if I do not speak then the system is almost maybe in the order. So when I am speaking means I am creating a disorderness and this type of so called disorderness will be because of even movement of atoms, molecules and so on and so on. If at 0 degree Kelvin that if that so called disorder or the entropy is 0 then you can that is what it is defined by the third law of thermodynamics. And further uh, as the temperature is above the 0 Kelvin absolute 0 Kelvin then you have this the entropy of the system is no more 0 that means there is you cannot say that there is no disorder that means there is an entropy entropy basically is what you say it is a degeneration of the so called energy. When whenever you say in uh, heat transfer those who are engineers or physicists they can understand at least the students there. So whenever there is a heat transfer taking place and which may be reversible process again and irreversible process 
then whenever there is irreversibility, then you have a generation ent you know, uh, entropy is being generated. Whenever there is a heat transfer, there is an entropy transfer. So when I say when entropy ceases to exist, that means there is neither the irreversible process nor the heat transfer process taking place. So that is what basically the entropy means. And so, but nobody has approached the so called 0 Kelvin where you are saying that 0 Kelvin the entropy is 0, this is only an hypothesis which till the, till the date has not been defined or which not been rejected. And so continued faith in its so called hypothesis is leading to many more activities and then people are working on superconductivity and all those things even at lower and lower sub 0 temperatures minus 100, minus 120, minus 130 and all the cryogenic activities are taking place uh, uh, or to say below the 0 degree centigrade temperatures. So next one is the dual nature of light very interesting. So the light is behaving like a wave as well as a particle well. So uh, the Pythagorean discipline uh, exactly even more than 20 centuries. So there were uh, of school, two schools of thoughts like one is the Pythagorean discipline and there is the Aristotle one. So Pythagorean discipline says that the visible light emits a steady stream of particles uh, on contrary the Aristotle uh, or school of thought is saying that light travels in a manner similar to that of the waves in the ocean like. So there is a cup of water like and then if you try to perturb or disturb then you will see that waves are getting generated from the center of disturbance to that of the towards away from the disturbance like. So but what it has been for instance both have proved that both are having I mean this school of thought is proving that it is having like a wave, wave nature uh, particle nature and then Aristotle school of thought is proving like this is like a wave nature and there were huge deliberations keep on going on even for how do you say till now also at least last, till the last century still. And then for instance if one of the above experiments is proven and unfortunately other could not be then can we say that the light is not behaving like the other way which has not been proved. And the dual nature of light clearly demonstrates the simultaneous validity of these so called two contradictory views and then you cannot either of them can be neglected like. Apart from this if you see uh, I am here and then I could see uh, all these uh, what is say uh, equipments and then uh, so called paraphernalia and then people here and then if you even go in the even macro level like the so called solar planetary system all these things are in very nice motion and then there is no at no disturbance at all. And had been any of these constants were to be not existing or they are having a slight deviation from these values then what you can keep think, thinking of about this existence and it may be beyond our imagination. So this is what the universal validity of this constants which we need to have even more faith on this so called constants further because of these constants may be that the universe is so called so fine tuned and the purpose behind this conflict, cosmic manifestation is basically to sustain life and then we will see why we need to have life and I think few deliberations were already occurred in the last uh, in the last class I mean last sessions like. So if I would like to make few remarks based on these so called examples based on faith. So they are non verifiable which I said verifiable the fundamental proof of each of the component of the theory may not be possible at all instances and then example as seen the Gödel's incompleteness theorem. And therefore, if we believe in a scientific theory, our belief in several elements of the theory is solely based on the faith. And only measurable observations are verifiable and the theory altogether has to be largely believed. What I mean to say, if there are few things which cannot be measured, then you cannot deny simply because you cannot measure. So your inability cannot be what is say construed as that it is not existing like. So what? the great uh, scientist the Max Planck. So he says on faith in reality, faith is therefore fundamental and is in indispensable in science which you cannot dispense, which you cannot neglect this. Anybody who has been seriously engaged in the so called scientific pursuit or scientific work of any kind realizes that over the entrance of these gates of the temple of science are the words written. You must have faith, it is a quality which scientists cannot dispense with. So, he is a Nobel laureate in physics in 1918, many of us know about him. And then what Charles Town says, 
is the Nobel laureate in physics in 1964. Science itself requires faith. We do not know our logic is correct and we scientists believe in the existence of the external world and the validity of our logic. We feel quite comfortable about it. Nevertheless, these are acts of faith. We cannot prove them. We have to accept as it is. So, if you see the other part of the story like uh, about uh, now we have seen few glances of examples of Ved scientific pursuit based on faith all and now we will see what Vedanta is saying and then what is the prominence of faith in Vedantic pursuit. You got to shorten your speech. How many you got to limit 5 minutes, 5 minutes. So, the faith is the center point be it in a scientific pursuit or in Vedantic pursuit and in scientific pursuit what you said Professor Ghosh was saying this is a bottom up approach bottom up approach you are trying to start from like as a molecules uh, atoms molecules and then keep on going up and this is what you say experiments bottom up approach which starts with postulates theory experiments laws and natural reality just I have cut down few terms in order to accommodate into this single slide and in, in the contrary view you have the top down approach where the knowledge is you are receiving through the different processes maybe like through sabda and then uh, anuman and prachaksha what Dr. Khan was saying and this is what you are getting from the top source nature of reality which is God and then through the set of axioms and then from that realizing the realization or realizing these axioms and then you will feel okay this is what is really existing and the faith is more profound in spirituality than in the science. So, we, uh, the persons who are practicing the spiritual things, they will have even more faith in what they are doing rather than the contrary thing. So, Vedanta and faith, the top down process is what it is saying, the God is the ultimate source of everything, you are accepting as it is. And the divine consciousness flows downward, that is our Ohapanta, top down process from God to every inquisitive living being and Krishna is saying this. And the knowledge from God can be received through these scriptures and realize the saintly persons. So, as was one of the question. So, we can say we have our own sense, we have our own free will and we have our own intelligence which was given by the Almighty. No point in saying again God if any of you have any aversion like. Still, so we are being guided by those things constantly and then continuously. So, we can decide whether what the knowledge which we are getting correct or not. The way example, suppose if I want to join in a institute like and then how do I know? Nobody is going to tell you. First you have to come out from your own cocoon and then say okay which college is good, which university is good like that. So, you are doing your own survey out of your own inquisitiveness. So, this is how you can see whether what the person is saying is correct or what the person, other person is saying is wrong or not. So, this is called as the knowledge received through this disciplic succession which is from Bhagavad Gita 4.2. So, a person who is familiar with the system of knowledge will know that the source of both these knowledges is the supreme being the Lord, the Almighty. And according to this Bhagavad Gita, knowledge is defined as the understanding of both the matter as well as the spirit basically which is the life. And as per if either of the things are missing, then you are completely in the dark or you are having an incompleteness. As for the Vedic, uh, Vedantic literatures, there are two categories of knowledge. They are Apravidya and then the Paravidya. So, Apravidya is what you say verifiable empiricism, that is what the material knowledge which we are basically trying to gain. And then it has the knowledge of grass and subtle matter and experienced by the sense perceptions. So, if your senses are wrong, you may be perceiving differently, and other person may be having a even better senses and he may be having what you say even better understanding. The way I, I could see without the specs, I may not be able to see beyond 1 kilometer light. So, all this what is say acquiring knowledge will be always limited with the senses. But in the so called Paravidya, you are accepting those things as it is. Like these are non verifiable experience, and at the instances, it may not be requiring any what is say validation at all. Because you yourself are experiencing eventually and gradually. And this is what the spiritual knowledge knowledge of the consciousness living being, transcendental life, and then the God and experience it through the discipline of yoga and then meditation and then devotional service. Basically yoga means not doing the pranayama and all those things. The ba basic word of yoga means connecting the soul to that of the super soul. The practice of connecting the soul to the super, super soul. So, there are three, fun uh, three fundamental principles in realizing the so called revealed knowledge I am trying to conclude. 
just couple of slides are left and all revealed knowledge should be accepted as divine axioms in order to not to have any conflicts. Genuine scriptures should be understood as they are and there should be no your own interpretation and a mood of true humility is essential in receiving the divine knowledge of God. If I say out of questioning, sometimes you may be what do you say uh, going through but you may not be really reaching the essence of what the knowledge is basically. So you need to have an humility and then humbleness. So what you say is the Vedanta Sutra 1.1.3, .1 the scriptures are the final proof as far as the Vedantic pursuit is concerned and it can be even extended to the rough scientific pursuit as well. The example would be now Srimad Bhagavatam says there are infinite number of universes existing in this creation but unless we require the scientific proof all the scientists may not be able to accept that. So now, now the scientists who are working with the space agencies are keep on trying to find even there are more and more and more universes are there, you know more galaxies are there in this creation. So if you go from bottom to top down then you may be putting tremendous amount of energy in realizing what you wanted to. But if you simply follow the top down process like this Paravidya then it, your job would be much more simpler that is what I want to see all. So yasya deve para bhakti yatha deve tatha guru tasyate katite hi artha prakashante mahatmana. So this is from the Svata Svata Upanishad. Only on to the growth, great souls who have implicit faith in both the Lord and the spiritual master are all the imports of Vedic knowledge automatically revealed. And further, Saganam Adir Antascha Madhyam Chaivaham Arjuna Adhyatma Vidya Vidyanam Vada Pravadatam Aham. Bhagavad Gita 10.32 says, Of all creations, I am the beginning and the end and also the middle. Basically, it means there is no start and no end. And O Arjuna, of all sciences, I am the spiritual science of the self and among logicians, I am the conclusive truth. And in summary, just if I want to collate everything and then put in nutshell like, a careful study of scientific and spiritual methodologies indicates an indispensable role of faith in so called realization, be it from scientific side or be it from a Vedantic perspective. The continued role of faith in science truly indicates the basic feature of the reality which can be incomprehensible to the human intellect. And Vedanta provides a broader platform for the realization of both experimental as well as the experiential reality. Further, a deeper study of both science and spirituality is essential for an inquisitive person that means you should not de-link only the science or only the spirituality. If you try to link these two things then the, you can appreciate the sublime role of faith in both the approaches and then you can see there is a supreme beyond, a being beyond it. So what Dr. Teddy Singh, my spiritual master, he says the electron could not be seen but its symptoms can be experienced the way which you have seen the cloud chamber experiment. Similarly, God may not be seen but can, ex can be experienced from the wonders, order of nature and then etc. What we are seeing the creation of the universe itself. So with this, I thank you. Thank you. For your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Ramji. Uh, you have delivered a nice lecture and let this lecture is open for discussion. Anybody uh, has any question you can ask, please. Mic dear, can, can anybody give mic to him? So thank you sir. So the question is what is the difference between soul and great soul and how a soul can become great soul? So soul, you mean great soul or super soul? No, you have said uh, great soul, super soul is ultimate. What is the difference between soul, great soul? So how a soul be, can become great soul? So the soul means maybe uh, a, a we like uh, which may not be having a proper knowledge like. So what the, uh, what you say any entity which is, which can be animated. When a body is having any, uh, having animation means it is having a soul like. So it may be that, that to that extent, it can be a living being or a animal or any virus like. But it can be a great soul when if you try to, you uh, have an understanding of, uh, as a human being we can having understanding of many things by using our intelligence and mind. So if you try to inculcate those things and then 
use those things for the humanity to the best possible extent, then you can at least you can become like a great soul. So, it is my understanding. So, those practices it may not the time may not be sufficient to tell. So, they are practices which have been delineated are explained in the scriptures. So, the that will be defined by the activities which you are doing, the activities which you are doing. So, um, so it can be so exhaustive like, so suppose uh, I am doing certain practices which makes me like suppose I am here and nobody can say that I am a 37 years old boy. Huh? old guy like. So, I am doing certain practices like doing a uh, chanting and all and then doing uh, what do you say yoga in the morning and then keep myself fit and myself not my body only. So, then I will say that actually I could able to understand few things which are which have been explained in the scriptures by the, under the guidance of a spiritual master and all. So, if I am trying to not me anyone who is trying to get inculcated in this particular process, particular practices which are devotional services basically, then you can say that. Oh, he may be by seeing the external symptoms, you can say that he may be a great soul because you, you have a priori knowledge of that. Yeah. Is there any other question? If there is no, I thank uh, Dr. Thank you very much. Ramji again. Now, I have the privilege to call, invite uh, oh. Mr. Sushant Sharma. Uh, for delivering his lecture on the flash of knowledge, I, I would like to introduce Sushant Sharma. He is a B.Tech graduate from IIT Guwahati. He has contributed enormously towards various activities of Bhakti Vedanta Institute as an author and as an editor as well. Under the able guidance of spiritual uh, visionary Dr. T.D. Singh, he has delivered keynote keynote lecture at the International Conference on Life and Its Origin in Rome in the year 2004. And I think there are many other things to introduce about him uh, by his lecture itself you will understand. I request you to continue his lecture. Thank you sir. Okay. So, 